guys, welcome to part two of flat sketching. Uh, where we're going to cover dresses and skirts. Um, and we're really going to go into sort of the rules of how seaming and darts work for fit. Uh, so let's get into it. So let's start with dresses. And what I want to do is um, I'm going to take a look at sort of a basic fitted dress. We could call it a shift if we want. Um, and see what our options are for fitting it. So I'm going to do just sort of basic um, outline of the body so we know how it's fitting. And let's take a dress and I'm just going to make again a very basic, I'm not even going to get into sleeves quite yet, and we're going to do just a basic dress like so. So we have our basic dress like this, okay? Now again, um, from carried over from part one, we are working with wovens, okay? So um, that means until we get to the knit section, everything that I'm talking about applies to wovens only. Uh, knits do not have the same sort of dart and closure requirements as wovens. So again, I'm dealing with wovens specifically. Okay, so um, when we are dealing with the dress, and this is going to be the front, um, and this is a fitted dress, which means it hugs the body closely, uh, we need to put in darts and seams to create that shape. Um, because if you remember from our first lesson, uh, woven fabrics do not stretch around the body. So any shape that needs to be put into the garment to hug the body and, and you know, uh, um, accommodate for, you know, the parts that go in, parts that go out, uh, need to be created with darts and seams. So um, there are a wide variety, almost limitless possibilities of darts and seaming that you can use to create this fit but they all need to follow some simple rules. And we'll look at some of the standard ones, but we'll also look at some, um, you know, um, less standard options. Um, and again, the rules that need to apply. So let's take a look at what needs to happen uh, when we place a dart or a seam on our dress for fit. So um, when we think about the body, um, and it's specifically for women, because uh, since we are doing dresses, uh, let's take a look at the body in profile, so from the side. So um, what we have is a shape that looks something like this. The legs, you know, go down, whatever. And as we can see, the uh, areas which um, are going to really dictate our fit are quite obvious. So from the waist up, we have the bust. The bust is our widest area. The waist is our most narrow area. And these principles are going to become very, very important. Below the waist, the hips are our widest area. So we have wide, we have narrow, and we have wide. And um, when we're creating fit, we have to adjust for these differences in circumferences of the body. So on the front, we can see that the area of fit basically is uh, relating to uh, the fullness of the bust. The bust is the sort of area um, that creates difficulties, otherwise we'd be pretty much just a tube and we wouldn't need any darts or seams for additional fitting. So um, I'm gonna place points on I haven't remembered that that's out of ink. Uh, I'm going to place points here and here, and that basically represents the nipple, or what we would call less crudely, the apex um, of the bust. And you should be familiar with that term from FD21, uh, uh, because of course when you created your darts uh, for your bodice slopers, you would have to have them pointing toward the apex, and you did a lot of fitting based on that point. And um, similarly, when we come to dress design, um, they're going to be very important for us 
uh, when we create our fit. Now here's the rule of thumb for darts. Um, I can place darts in this dress to create fit. I can place them pretty much anywhere so long as they are pointing toward the apex and coming from a seam. Okay, so what are some of my options? Well, I can have shoulder darts coming down here like this. These are very standard dart constructions. We see shoulder darts a lot. Now you see they don't come all the way to the apex and typically we tend to not go all the way to the apex. We keep our darts at least a half an inch away from the dart point. Um, and this is because when the darts or go directly to the dart point, um, it creates a little point um, right at the apex and sort of gives you this sort of pointy nipple look. Um, if that's what you want, bring your darts all the way to the apex. If it's not, and it typically isn't, um, keep your darts a little bit uh, away from the actual uh, dart point or apex point. Okay. So this is fine. It follows our true rules. It comes from the seam, coming from the shoulder seam, and it's pointing toward our dart points. Perfectly fine. Works. Two points. Two rules are accounted for, okay? We can also have little side darts. Again, very common, very common. Same rules apply. Coming from the seam, now it's coming from the side seam, pointing towards the dart, or pointing towards the uh, uh, apex, okay? Let's take a look at some other darts. Let's take a look at a French dart. Now, a French dart comes from about the high hip and kind of curves its way up toward, you guessed it, the apex. Perfectly fine. Again, coming now, still from the side seam, shaped a little bit different, shaped a little bit longer, but still going toward that destination of the apex. We can also do neck darts. Now it's not coming from a seam, but it's coming from the edge of the fabric, which is good enough, it still applies, um, and pointing toward our apex. Perfectly fine. Now you can also have multiple darts um, doing the same thing, and this will um, increase your ability to fit closer. So if you have a very, very tight fit, um, you probably do want additional darts. So you might have neck darts, and you might have a version of a French dart coming up like this. Um, and you can continue, you can put as many darts as you want. Add some little side bust darts there. Perfectly fine, but you'll notice in every case, they are pointing toward the apex. Now again, this is because when we have a dart, as you probably know, a dart is a sort of triangular piece put into a pattern that we close. And when we close it, this part becomes negative space, so this part gets reduced, but it creates a sort of curve of fullness at the point. And since we want fullness here along the bust, that is why our dart points are pointing toward that area. Wherever our darts point, that's where we get fullness. Okay? Now, I can put my darts anywhere, and they don't need to be symmetrical. They just typically are, because typically our clothes are symmetrical, but sometimes they're not. If I want to put a armhole dart here, I can. If I want to put one here like this, I can. That's still fine. I have it from both sides. And again, I can put my darts anywhere along the contour. And again, as long as they point up toward that apex point, I mean, that's an awful lot of darts, but I'm just showing you all the different options you have. They are still applicable. They work. So again, the rule for your darts or they come from the edge of a garment or a seam. Now they don't have to come from all the way to the end, so um, let's, let's actually take a little bit of a look at maybe, not an exception, but a sort of difference. What if I had a waist seam on this dress? 
then I could have my darts coming up like this. Okay? Now you notice that I kind of pull, I, I have them kind of flared out. They go a little bit closer together at the waistline and a little bit further apart at the bust line. Um, this is not necessary. However, it is flattering. Um, let me show you the difference. So um, be careful. We will typically see this sort of flaring out because if I either flare them out the other way or keep them perpendicular, it's not very flattering to the waist. If we pinch it in, it sort of gives the figure a little bit more of that hourglass shape. It kind of pushes out the bust and it kind of brings in the waist. So you will typically make those darts a little bit more narrow at the waist because it's more attractive um, for the wearer. But again, still our same rules are applying. It's coming from a seam or edge of the fabric um, and going and pointing toward our bust points. All these are fine for fit and will do the job. Now let's take a look at seams. Now seams have a related rule that, um, again, are tied to where the bust points are. Now, for our seams, if you would like to create your fit with a seam instead of a dart, you can. And the rule for that is very much the same. It must, you know, to be a seam, it's going to start at an edge of uh, the piece of fabric. So, and it can really start wherever you want. And it will also end at another point in the, the fabric. Um, but it must pass through those bust points. So let's look at some very typical um, seam construction. So one of the most common seams that you'll see in a dress like this are your princess seams, which will run down um, the figure like this. And you can see they are passing through those bust points. Okay? Those seams will create the fit you need. What are some of our other options? Well, we can also do a sort of side panel, which is a sort of cousin of the princess seam, but they don't start at the shoulder and end at the hem. They may end, start at the, you know, uh, armpit here and then kind of go and then meet back up at that side seam. Again, perfectly fine because it um, has all of our rules. It's passing through the uh, bus point and it's starting and ending along the edge of, um, of the section of our garment. Here's another one. It's called a bib because it kind of resembles uh, a bib. Again, it's doing the fitting that we want because it's uh, adhering to the rules. It's passing through the bust points and starting and ending um, at a seam or edge of the fabric, okay? Um, and I could go on and on, but let me just show you how this can be stretched. So these are some very common seams that are used to uh, fit dresses or shirts or anything else like that. But let's sort of take this rule to the extreme. Um, you might say, okay, Kate, well, I'm going to start and end a seam that I've never seen before, but as long as I pass through those bust points, you say it'll be okay. Well, let's test it out. Let's say I'm going to start here, and I need to pass through a bust point, so I'm going to do this, but then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do this. Will that seam work? Yes. Uh, because again, it's passing through those two bust points, it is starting and ending, on the edge of the fabric, so it will absolutely work. Again, I wouldn't necessarily want to be the one that sews it. This is a, a more complex construction um, that would be appropriate only for higher price points um, and more skilled craftsmen, uh, but it will work. Um, end of the day, you can get your fit that you need from that seam, okay? So have fun with this, um, and always remember uh, that you need to have some sort of seaming if you are gonna have a fitted dress. Now again, this is only applicable to fitted dresses. So let me show you uh, where you would not need 
any sort of darts or seams for a dress. So this dress is very close to the figure, and I'm going to put it there for reference. But let's say that you are creating like a, a tent or big A-line dress that um, from maybe the bottom of the armhole just comes out like this. Uh, just big like that. This, of course, is just for reference. It would be there. This dress has no fit. It does not follow the body. It does not narrow down at the waist. It just kind of flows out there. You would not need any sort of darts or seams for this dress, period. Um, and that would go for shirts as well. If you just have a big blousy shirt, you don't need it. So darts and seams are just really for um, fit and shape uh, where you want them. Now there's other ways to create this. So um, let's take a shirt that handles fullness a little bit differently than this very standard one. I'm going to make a shirt. And let's say I have a shirt that um, it's very, it has maybe shirring around the neck. It's very full. And it sort of blouses out and then comes in at the waist. Something like this like so, okay? This, I don't need darts or seams for either because uh, it's not technically fitted. Even though it's close here at the waist, we're creating that difference from full to narrow or full to narrow um, a little bit differently with this. So the fullness is created by the shirring and then it's gathered up here by this sort of waistband um, uh, piece down here. And so um, these tucks and these, this shirring is creating that difference in shape. So I don't need darts or seams in addition to this. This would be perfectly fine. And we'll also see sort of um, some little versions of this. So let me do another one that's kind of common that I've seen, is that I may put a, a designer might put a seam kind of just under the bust, maybe like right like this, and then have shirring come up from here, and then this would be kind of fitted below that seam. These are usually done with a v-neck, but it doesn't really matter. Um, and we may or may not have a seam here, but it doesn't really matter either. So what's happening here is the seam is not going through the bust point up here, um, but the fullness needed is created by shirring instead. So um, again, it's a little bit away from the rules and we're using sort of shirring or tucks to create the fullness we need where we need it um, instead of utilizing darts or seams. Okay. Another thing too I want to um, sort of go over, I'm going to do just a little dress too. So let's finish up sort of what we need on the front for our dresses. And dresses are really hard. I mean, I'm trying to give you these really broad general rules because, you know, for the other types of garments that I'm doing, um, you know, I'm doing the standard shirt, a standard jacket, I'm going to do a standard pair of jeans. There's no real standard dress. There's no real standard skirt either. Maybe just a flared skirt, but um, uh, there's just so much variety uh, that I can't really focus on any standard. I just have to sort of try to pick up these general rules. Um, so let's go ahead and make a dress. Um, I made it a little sexier with a v-neck. Now the rules for armhole seams apply to dress, same, one, same ones as we had for the uh, shirt. Um, if it is not a dolman or um, uh, kimono sleeve, it's going to go ahead and need an armhole sleeve seam. Now, not a lot of dresses have sleeves, but some of them do. Let's put a little, a little maybe three-quarter length sleeve on our dress, why not? Um, so I have those armhole seams there. Now let's put in, you know, something for our fit because of course we learned we need that. Um, I'm trying to think, is there any other standard ones that I didn't do? Not really, I went over the standard ones. So I guess we can just put in our princess seams, which again, they're very flattering, nice, these nice long seams. Uh, they're very good for fit, too. They allow for um, very precise fitting uh, princess seams. That's why they're so popular. Um, that pretty much is good for the 
front, of course, um, I need top stitching anywhere it's going to be finished. So the cuffs of the sleeves, the hem of the dress, the neckline, if there's nothing attached to it, like a collar. Now, um, I want to sort of go over a little bit of some exceptions with your top stitching. Um, now, you may have heard of a thing called a blind stitch hem. Blind stitch hem is a little bit more expensive way to finish garments and is usually seen on more expensive sort of formal wear, dress wear, things of that sort. And it's a technique where only a tiny, tiny bit of the uh, stitching used to finish the hem is seen on the outside. So hence um, a blind stitch hem. It just sort of looks like the uh, fabric is folded under. You can do this by machine or you can do this by hand. Um, the hand ones really are pretty blind. Um, it's very difficult to see the stitching. Uh, the ones done by machine are much more subtle than your uh, typical top stitch seen in a hem finish, but it's a little less bl blind than the one uh, you do by hand. That's why I like to do mine by hand. Um, but in any instance, if you want to indicate a blind hem stitch on a dress, and this is very applicable to um, dress wear. So again, if you're working for uh, in a market which has um, slightly more formal uh, dress clothes uh, at a higher price, because again, the blind stitch hem is a little bit more expensive to apply, uh, you can do it on your flats. And if you were to indicate that on a flat, it would look a little bit different. There's a couple options that you can do. One is you can use sort of smaller, further apart dots to indicate a blind stitch hem like so. Um, or you can just leave it out completely. In either case, it is important to indicate in, with text on your flat that you've used a blind stitch hem. Again, because it's a little bit out of the ordinary, um, and we need to sometimes annotate our flats uh, just to make sure that everything is crystal clear about the construction. I'm going to mention too, I didn't mention this before, a lot of times I get uh, questions from students too, um, how do we indicate the side seams and the shoulder seams and the underarm seams and the seams that are typically, you know, uh, placed on the side. So. Um, you probably know this, but uh, flat drawings are called flat drawings because they are representing the garment as if they were laid flat on the table. So we get a front view and we get a back view that is completely flat. And on the edge is assumed, always assumed, unless otherwise noted, that there will be a side seam, there will be a shoulder seam, there will be an armhole seam or uh, an uh, underarm seam. These are always assumed unless otherwise um, indicated on your flat. Uh, the only exception may be with, uh, uh, I'm sure there's other exceptions that I'm forgetting, but one exception might be if you have that dress shirt with the yoke, um, it is assumed that if you have a yoke, there is not going to be a shoulder seam. Um, but again, it's always best to indicate things um, and make it as crystal clear. But for the most part, when we draw flats, side seams are so ubiquitous and almost found on almost every garment that we are going to just assume that there are side seams here and we don't need to do any additional um, uh, indication that there is a side seam or a shoulder seam, so on and so forth, just because they're so, so common. Okay, um, one more thing I want to go over on the front of this garment, and that is walking ease. So this, we can say, maybe comes down to about mid-thigh. Um, so it's still kind of high enough to uh, skirt the issue of work walking ease. But as uh, we start to go lower and lower down with our hems, walking ease becomes a very important issue, especially um, with closely fitting garments. And we can assume, I can use um, this little diagram here. So what is walking ease? If you've not heard the term before, it is extra... Uh, venting or fabric that is needed to accommodate the different motions of legs. So when we stand still, we our legs might be like this, and we might have a 
you know, ability to have a very narrow skirt like this, okay? But as we start to begin to walk, this becomes much wider. So that previously narrow skirt before is now gonna create a very big problem. And if we don't allow, especially um, in longer hems, proper walking ease, we can only do little hobbly steps. And in fact, this was actually once the style, believe it or not. Um, about the turn of the century in uh, 1910s, uh, there was a designer, uh, Prare, Prare, I'm pretty sure it's Prare, um, uh, he uh, developed a type of skirt that was literally called the hobble skirt because it did not allow for any walking ease. It was long. It was kind of had a peg top up here, so it had a little bit of fullness up here, but would come down and be very, very narrow at the bottom uh, and not allow for any walking ease. And it got dubbed the term the hobble skirt because you could only kind of hobble around very awkwardly in it. Uh, luckily, they're not in style anymore. Uh, if they were, we'd all be still hobbling around. So, let's assume that people are going to walk in our garments and add walking ease. So, on something like this, um, we might just need to add a little bit of a slit right here. And again, since this is short, um, it's not as important as when it gets longer. Um, let's take a look at some of our walking ease options in longer garments. So let's do another dress um, and let's assume it's going to be long. Also I want to, um, I think this might be a good place to do a little bit of a side note on mermaid skirts and walking ease because I have certainly had some students create some hobbly mermaid skirts. So, um, or mermaid dresses as well. You just get that silhouette. Let's let's take a look at it in just a skirt because that's the important part that we're, we're working on. So a mermaid skirt, so let's, I'm going to draw the legs here so you're getting a an idea of where it's kind of fitting and where it's going to be. So let's assume we have our... legs... that are more or less even, like so. Okay, here's our body. Let's start the skirt up here. And as you know, our mermaid skirts kind of come down and flare out. Now, where students make the mistake in either designing it, but more detrimentally in making them, is they begin the flare out too high. Now, the whole purpose of the mermaid skirt is to sort of elongate the legs. And it is assumed that the flare out starts at the knees because it's kind of proportionally nice like that. And because it kind of elongates the figure, it kind of seems like it does. However, most mermaid skirts will start above the knees. And this is to accommodate walking ease. Okay, it will, if we drop this down and keep it close uh, to the figure around the knees, you're going to have a hobbly skirt. But if we raise it up a little bit, we get that much needed fullness from the flare out of the sort of mermaid part of the skirt uh, much sooner and allows for the knees to actually move and it creates that walking ease. Um, so just keep that in mind, um, you know, especially when you're making mermaid skirts. Uh, like I said, I've, I've definitely had more than one student make gorgeous, beautiful mermaid skirts, and then they put it on the model, and the model has to sort of uh, 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 shuffle around quite awkwardly. Fine for pictures, not for use. Okay, to continue on with walking ease. Let's take a look, uh, a look at the a back of a long dress that would have a narrow silhouette. Now, you don't need to worry about walking ease if your skirt flares out. So if you have a lovely long dress 
that um, flares out at the end. So if you have something that looks, you know, like this, just imagine it's symmetrical, that's fine, don't worry about it. That's plenty of walking ease down here in this flare. This is really for tight fitting dresses. Something that would look a lot more like this. Now let's assume this is full length. And for the sake of accuracy, let's go ahead and put it in our darts. Uh, we gotta do it, right? Um, anyway, so in this instance, one of the most common solutions is a slit. Um, and we can go ahead and put a slit anywhere we'd like. They're most commonly found in a seam. So uh, let's, you know, put it here and then we can slit it open like this. And most slits will have to be finished with a top stitch. Um, one is fine, two is even better. Now you do not need to put your slits in the side seam. You can put them wherever you like. You can cut them out of the middle too. So if you don't want it in the side seam, maybe you want one of those nice ones where they have just have the legs, the one of the legs peeking out, you can have one here. Now most of the time when you see it like this, it's in addition to a princess seam like this, so it is in a seam, but you don't need to put it in a seam, okay? But you do need to finish it with maybe a little bit of top stitch, unless of course you're going with a blonde hem stitch option, which would be appropriate for more expensive markets. Okay. Now, um, there is another alternative, because you might be saying, all right, well, I like the narrow silhouette, but, you know, slits, they show a lot of skin. My customers may be a little bit more modest, or it's colder weather, or I just, you know, they don't want to show that much leg. Um, then we have another option, and um, it's called a kick pleat. Now, this is most commonly seen on skirts, so I'm going to draw it on a skirt, although you can put it on a dress if you would like but it is most commonly seen on like a little pencil skirt that you might wear to work or school or something like that. So let's do a little pencil skirt. Let's assume it's coming down to maybe about the calf um, and it's quite narrow, um, obviously creating a whole bunch of walking ease issues. So what we do is in the center back seam, although you can put these anywhere so long as it's in a seam, if you want to put them in a center front seam, a side seam, a princess seam, fine. We just typically see them in the back, in a center back seam. What we'll see is what we will do is we will hide a little inverted box pleat right in that center back seam. And um, this is a very clever little solution to our walking ease problem because um, at rest, when our legs are together, the pleat is closed because we have it folded and we maintain that very narrow silhouette. But when we're walking, um, the motion of our legs uh, can expand the pleat and create ease um, and movement, uh, allow for movement. Now, if I were to sort of draw what's on the inside, um, I can do that. Let me just show you on the inside what's going on so you know what you know is happening with this kick pleat. So this kick pleat is a pleat. So this is, has folded fabric going on the inside here. Kind of like this. So this little extra pleat on the inside, although we can't see it, is there to allow us a little extra ease for our uh, walking purposes. All right, so that's walking ease. Now I want to flip back to the dress and I want to go over um, closures for dresses. Um, and I'm going to do this on the back. Um, oh, and also go over seaming and darting on the back. So let's go ahead and put in our very fitted dress again. And let's make it a little bit longer this time. Something like this. Well, I guess we won't see it as much as the bust on the back. So it might look a little bit more kind of like this on the back. Oh, these markers are kind of annoying. Okay, so here's 
the back of her dress, and um, so basically I want to focus on two things. I want to focus on closures, and I want to focus on um, fitting for the back. So um, I erased my little girl, but um, on the back we have the similar issues as fitting on the front. And again, if we take a look at this figure in profile, um, we will notice you know, our fitting issues uh, on the back. And it is related, uh, in this instance, to um, the butt instead of the bust. So we have our widest part here instead of up here. Um, this means that uh, we have a similar rules for the back, but the points are different. Instead of having bust points, because there's not really anything going on in our back here, it's rather flat, um, we're going to have a bust point here that, or a butt point um, that represents the fullest part of the hip uh, or butt. And they're pretty much just down here. Now, um, same rules apply. Same rules apply. So I can use a dart um, to fit around the back. Um, however, we don't see as many different dart variations in the back as we do for the sort of front bust area. Um, we're typically going to see either a long dart, a, a diamond dart, or sometimes they're called fish darts. I'm not quite sure why they're called fish darts. Like this. Now you can use these on the front. I didn't actually go over this, I forgot, but you can use these on the front as well, as long as these guys are pointing up toward your dart points. Um, we see these very commonly in dresses and shift dresses. Um, they're called diamond darts because they're basically a diamond shaped dart um, that looks like this and we can see sort of how they will work. So here's the waist, it's the most narrow point. So we take in, we place the widest part of the diamond dart there so it takes in the most amount of fabric to narrow it down in the small waist part and then it tapers off to create fullness uh, down here when we need it down here and up here when we use them on the front for the bust. Um, and also, you know, um, we have, you know, a little bit of shoulder blade here, but it's typically not as big a deal as the other ones. Okay, so we see these starts a lot. We will also see if there is a waist seam starts coming down like this. And now this is, you know, you should be remembering being reminded of uh, your um, uh, skirt slopers from FD21 because they have those darts in them too. Now same thing was when we do the darts in the back, we want to taper them in, in toward the waist. So taper them in toward the waist for the same reasons that we want to do it on the front. So that means it's just a little bit nicer to look at. So just as an example, which show kind of going through, you know, top to bottom. We could have something kind of crude like this, which isn't very flattering to the figure, okay? And this would represent, since there's a seam here, darts going up from the seam and another set of darts going down, not necessarily a diamond dart. Now let's angle those in to see the difference. more flattering, pinches in the waist. Okay, so um, darts on the back, although same rules apply, you say, oh, but those are very, very limited. Can I do what? It, it has to start on the side and point like this, will that work? Technically, yes. Technically, that would work. It's going to create fullness in here. We just very rarely see it because it's very awkward to have those lines go around the hips like that. Um, and we'll typically see either one of those two darts that I just showed you. Okay. Now, uh, same rules for seaming apply. And again, for the most part, you're going to see kind of princess seams like this on the back as well. So long as they, again, hit those dark, uh, butt points, they're going to work. They're going to be just fine.
But let's see what else we can do. Again, let's put in our points. Now you have a little bit more wiggle room with the uh, butt points than you do the bust points. Um, just because it's kind of a larger area. Um, so, you know. Any seam, and again, I don't want to go over all the standard ones because all the standard ones from the front are the same for the back. Again, they just need to hit those two points. But just to demonstrate my um, point, if I wanted a seam that went like that, again, it would be fine, again, because I am uh, going through my two points. So um, just remember, whenever you have a woven fabric that you need fit um, and it needs to hug the body, to apply these rules to those situations. Um, and you know, have fun with it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so bored with students that just, you know, oh, I need to do a dart and they just throw in, you know, uh, they just go down their flat line and, you know, uh, with, you know, just some fish darts on every single garment. Um, you know, you have a, like I said, you have an almost unlimited, actually not almost, a, an unlimited option of dart and seaming uh, possibilities uh, for your design. So try to figure out what complements your design best, what looks best, what is going to be interesting. Um, don't just throw them on there. It's technically correct, but it's boring as heck. Okay, closures. Let's put in some seams for the sake of them. Now, um, with wovens, and we need to have uh, closures. And for dresses, they're typically zippers, usually invisible zippers, but if you want an exposed zipper, that is fine. Um, here is the rule for zippers. So if we imagine um, the zipper is there so we can t uh, take our garment on and off. So what happens when we're taking our garment on and off? So if we go over here and look at the figure, the very narrow part is the waist. And what the closure needs to do is it needs to open up this very small part so it can fit over the hips or the bust area. So when we are creating our zipper, we need to open up the waist area, okay? So all zippers must usually come, you know, um, the most standard zipper construction we'll see is a zipper that comes from the neck all the way down through the waist. If it doesn't go through the waist, it doesn't open up the waist. That's one of the most common uh, mistakes that students make is they'll stop it at the waist. That does nothing to help us. And it'll go down to a, a little bit below the full hip, okay? And um, this is a perfectly fine zipper. Again, it's opening up. It's opening up our neckline. Well, I'm going to do a little tangent on necklines and openings in a minute. And comes down and will open up all the way down to a little bit below the full hip, which will give us ample room to fit the small part of the waist. It'll open up that small part of the waist to fit over our bust or our hips. Now, most zippers are placed in seams. So we usually always have to continue a seam down and this would be a center back seam that we place a zipper in. Um, this will make a lot of sense if you've ever sewn in a zipper. So when you sew in a zipper you are taking two pieces of fabric and having them come together and part of that seam where the pieces of fabric come together is going to be the zipper but where the zipper ends, we need to continue the seam. If this was your normal, like uh, an invisible zipper, and I just decided not to have a um, invisible, uh, or sorry, a center back seam in there, um, basically that means what I'm doing is, I could grab a little scrap piece of fabric or even paper, So imagine this was very long, okay, if I were to do this, I am cutting a slit for the zipper, and then there's nothing beyond it. 
However, when I put the seat, uh, zipper in, I need seam allowance from these parts. So what will happen is this a little bit here will go into the zipper on this side. So you can see that's the seam allowance I would need for the zipper. Same thing on this side. And then when I put it all together, what happens is I get a pucker at the bottom. Okay? So that is why if we would like our zippers to fit in smoothly, we must put them in a seam. Otherwise, we're going to get a big ugly pucker right at the base of our zipper right where we don't want it. Now, there is exceptions to this, and um, I used to not even mention this exception because it was hard enough for me to get students to place all of their zipper closures in seams, um, but it is very, it becoming much more common, um, and that is to have a large exposed zipper. Now, in this construction, you have a very large zipper that you can sort of see the teeth, and again, I'm kind of exaggerating, but like this. Okay? In this instance, what is happening is the zipper itself is large enough that when you cut the slit to put it in, it creates enough seam allowance to be able to finish it cleanly. Now this only works for large exposed zippers. Any other type of zipper construction, whether it be your normal, uh, just normal basic zipper, or an invisible zipper needs to be placed in a seam. But with this guy, what needs to happen is top stitching needs to be placed around because that is how we place the zipper in the garment. Okay? Um, so that's our closure. Now again, our closure can be placed anywhere. anywhere. Our zippers can be placed anywhere on the body. Uh, they're just typically found in the center back, but they're also very often found in a side seam. Same rules apply. They will open up right um, maybe an inch below uh, the armhole and go down to a little bit below the um, uh, hip line. Um, same rules apply, again, to open up that middle waist area. Very important. Okay, uh, one other thing I want to mention just about necklines, and this applies to dresses and shirts. So in our shirt section, we talked about um, how a button-down pocket is really important, um, and that will open up our neck. But let's say I have, I'm just doing like a blousey blouse, and it is um, very close to the neck like this, and I don't really need a, I don't want to put in a, a Maybe something like this. Maybe we'll make it a little, little, little sort of tank top deal with a shirt neck. These are cute little styles, and it's kind of maybe it's going to be flowy. So blah blah blah. I don't need any seaming. I don't really need anything. Okay, I, I don't have. I don't need a button pocket for this. I don't want a button pocket for this. I don't need any seaming because it's it's blousy and full. So blah blah blah. I'm good, right? Well, remember that if this is very close to the neck, your head is bigger than your neck. So how is someone going to get their head through this? So you have one or two options. Um, one, you can simply make the neckline bigger um, to be able to fit over the head. But if you don't want that, you need to create a closure just for the head. So oftentimes, imagine this is the back of the shirt. Um, you'll have something that looks like this. You'll have like a little button and it will kind of go like this and create a loop like that. And this is open. So what this does is when I unbutton this, this will open up this sort of section of the shirt. I'm able to put it over my head, button it back up, and um, wear it. A lot of times it's finished with a little bias tape or whatever you want to finish it with. Um, okay, so I just wanted to pop over on that uh, really quickly. Okay, now hop on over to skirts. And for the most part, um, skirts are a lot like dresses. Um, all the, you know, the, the backside dart and seaming rules apply to skirts. Um, I just want to go over a few different things. 
Um, one, the fact that most skirts have waistbands, although you do not need a waistband for a skirt. So skirts can be finished one of two ways on the top. Uh, let's do a little flare skirt. Okay. Um, you can either have a waistband like such, or you can finish it with a facing. So if you want to eliminate your waistband, you can. You want to have a clean finish up top, fine. So what we're going to do is we will erase that waistband, but what you would need to do is add top stitching, and that indicates that it is finished with facing, and you would need that, of course, um, uh, to attach your facing to the waistline. Okay, and of course the hem is going to have top stitching too. Now, closure rules apply, but they don't need to be as large because we're starting a little bit lower. So, same thing about hip or high hip, and you can actually keep it shorter on flared skirts because again, they, they give you more ease, so as they go out, um, uh, they're becoming bigger and bigger. So you can, you can shorten it up a little bit on your flare skirts, but we still need to open up that waistline a little bit. So there, that little zipper there would be fine for me. Okay, a couple other things I want to, I'm gonna use this opportunity to talk about um, shape and seaming um, in skirts. So uh, let's go back to that mermaid skirt that we talked about before. So whenever we have dramatic changes in shape, Usually a seam is causing it. So for instance, let's go back to that mermaid skirt like I was talking about, and let's make a really, really dramatically flaring out little thin or whatever you want to call it, flare for the bottom. Um, what I would need to do that is a horizontal seam. Okay, this indicates, okay, that's my fitted area. It's going to end along this horizontal seam, and then I can really Load out the shape. So see how much that's changing? That really, really amazing, and then this can be super full. It would have to be, of course, for that big shape, um, uh, so on and so forth. But to create that shape, maybe even we have some shirring up here creating it, um, I need that seam, okay? Whenever you want a very dramatic uh, and, and sudden change in silhouette, uh, you usually need to put a seam to uh, use that. So I'm going to show you a few examples of that because we see that all over um, and throughout many, many different garments. So see this big puff out for that mermaid shirt, a, a skirt, again, it's because we have that seam and I can really do, I can either sure this part or change the grain um, that will cause this very dramatic change in shape. Now if I didn't have it, I can still have a mermaid skirt without it, but the shape is going to be very different. Let's say I created the flare with gores instead, um, which are panels, you know, kind of princess scene panels. It would be a lot more subtle and smooth. So there's never that point that goes like that. It's a lot more subtle and not quite, there's not that big dramatic change in shape from the other ones. Okay, let's see where else this applies. Let's look at, I'm going to look at sleeves. So bell cuffs are very popular. Sometimes, I don't know. I don't know if you like guys like bell sleeves. Say we have a bell sleeve, and I want the bell to be very, very exaggerated. I need to put a little seam in right here, and then I can create a really big, poofy, lovely little uh, bell sleeve type of deal coming up like that. Again, I can create a bell sleeve without this seam, but it's going to be a lot more kind of subtle, and the shape isn't going to change that dramatically in any one place. It's more of a sort of smoothed out area, okay? We can do this in dresses too, so very... Um, common style of dress is sort of the baby doll dress, which is... You know, it's, it's very fitted, but um, let's do a little strapless baby doll. Maybe do a little hew, hew. And here's a little waist seam. We need that waist seam because what I want to do is boom, boom, and 
have this, you know, very fluffy, um, flared out skirt. Again, I, I'm exaggerating, but I just, you know, I want you to get the idea of it. You know, it can be very full, of course, la la la. And I need that seam right there. Now, this is also a very interesting case because I want, uh, uh, when people mess up on closures, they mess up a lot here. So let's just take the back view of this, which might look like this. And let's shade, shade the front. And a lot of students will put the zipper closure there and end it there. Now we can't do that. You are going to have to go into that skirt, create that center back seam, because uh, again, we need that waist to open up like so. Okay, so just to show you that. Okay. So remember, whenever you want that dramatic change in shape, or, you know, uh, we, can, we can do lots of fun things like that. Like, uh, let's go back to uh, the skirt, and I'm going to do kind of a, an interesting construction. Let's see when we have a skirt with maybe like a patch like this, and then let's say we have like drapes coming from there, which would cause the side to sort of uh, ruffle like that. Um, perfectly fine, but again, now it's not only causing a different, this uh, uh, seam is not only allowing for a difference in shape, it's allowing for a difference in texture. I can put those, uh, those sort of drapes and those tops right into that seam. Um, so again, whenever you want that change in shape or that change in texture, um, usually a seam is involved. Uh, so place them accurately um, and, you know, that's going to really determine your silhouettes, your shapes, which is oh so important in fashion. Okay guys, that about wraps up uh, part two and I will see you again in part three, which we're going to wrap up um, our flat explanations. Um, with pants and with knits. So I'll see you then. Bye-bye.